If we haven't met yet, my name is Bronson Hill, I'm the CEO of Bronson Equity. We've got 200 million in multifamily assets, um, mostly in the Southeast. We also are doing ATMs and car washes and oil and gas and some alternative stuff as well. Uh, we do panels like this once a month to help educate and to have conversations around what's happening in multifamily, in the uh, economic environment. And so really excited to get started here. So I introduce our panel. Um, again, Ellie will be on her way shortly. We have uh, Michael Blanc from Nighthawk Equity. Welcome, Michael. Hey there. Awesome. We've got uh, Ken McElroy from MC Companies. And uh, Ellie will be joining us in a little bit here. I'm going to keep an eye if she is in the crowd. Um, just send me a message. I think I have to pull you up or pull her up. So if somebody sees Ellie in the crowd, let me know. Um, so we'll go ahead and jump in. Let's let's talk a bit about how things are changing, right? We're seeing interest rates have risen a lot, really particularly in the last um, six months or so. We're seeing a lot more uh, challenges within multifamily. Expenses are higher. Uh, valuations are lower. Things particularly for value, value add deals. We're really seeing some pain or some deals that are really having trouble. Um, Ken, why don't you paint a little picture and welcome everybody just to just paint a little picture of what you're seeing right now in multifamily. First of all, I didn't know rates went up, so that's new to me. I, I uh, no, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm glad we could educate you. Uh, well, obviously, eleven rate increases. Uh, you know, the the intention of the Fed all along was to lower in, inflation. So, unfortunately, shelter, uh, food, energy, all that was inflationary, and shelter is uh, what we're all talking about. And um, so clearly, you, you know, what's happened is there's a massive value change uh, as as rates go up sellers are having to accept less and buyers are are not willing to pay more you know because the cost of debt is up so you know it, it stands the reason that this is you know not uncommon uh where you know when rates go up there's a repricing it just happened to you know, be consecutive and it, it's one big blow. And, uh, you know, we don't know where it's all headed. So it's true. I think a lot of people that got caught with, um, you know, short-term debt, bridge debt, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're in a bit of trouble right now with their rate caps and running out of cash and stuff like that. Um, you know, so, uh, there's certainly a, a, a number of the, those things going on, but, um, but, you know, I think that, um, it's going to boil down to operations at this point, you know, not only, but uh, one big thing, what we've done, we've hunkered down the last year. Uh, we've literally reviewed all our contracts. We're, we're hardcore negotiating every single thing we can trying to squeeze out every nickel we can. And we're trying to keep as highly occupied as we can. And so we're at 96%. Our portfolio is at 96% right now. That's excluding um, a, a renovated property or a lease up. Um, so, you know, that's the one thing that we have in our control because everything else um, is a bit of a wild card. Absolutely. Yeah, we're seeing it, you know, like you mentioned with expenses and we're seeing it in the Southeast with insurance, particularly in Florida, uh, labor costs, material costs. We're seeing seeing a lot of stuff. Uh, Michael, what are you seeing as far as operations? Are you seeing similar or anything you want to add to that uh, as far as just some of the challenges that we're facing right now as investors? We're kind of in an odd environment where we're playing defense while trying to play offense at the same time. So you got to real you got to wear two separate hats. If you own multifamily property that you bought in the last two years, okay, you put that hat on, and you use floating rate debt, you will feel the pain. Well, you'll feel the pain even if you fix debt, but particularly if you have floating rate debt, you are now feeling the pain. And if you're not operating to Kenny's point very well, your cash flows squeezed. And even if you are operating well, no one could possibly foretell uh, these interest rate caps. So even the problem is you're not even rewarded for good operations because you're still going to come up with millions of dollars sometimes for these stupid rate cap expirations. <clears throat> so existing operators are getting squeezed and they're struggling. Now, now take the hat off and put a new hat on. If you're looking to buy, it's going to be a fabulous time because we're going to start picking up deals. In fact, it's starting to trick a little bit from these distressed operators who need to sell because they're either running out of cash and or can't afford or can't fund the the cap the, the interest rate cap uh, extensions. And so valuations have come way down and they need to sell because they don't have the money to extend the cap rates. So they're under the gun, right? It's gonna be an, an utter buyer's market uh, and the retrading is gonna be incredibly bad depending if you're the seller or the buyer. So if you have never bought anything before, opportunity is, is, is ahead 
uh, if you are still looking to buy, opportunity is is ahead. So it's a it's a difficult time because you're you're putting out fires on the one hand, yet there's going to be amazing opportunities over the next six to twelve months. Yeah, it is interesting. That's an interesting way to look at it. Playing defense while you're playing offense. Uh, let's talk for a minute about operations. Um, you know, obviously, there's a huge difference between uh, solid operators that are operating things well. Uh, I mean, you mentioned Ken, 96 percent. That's super impressive across your portfolio. Um, you know, what would you say, it's particularly in value add deals? Is that are, what, what sort of if you're doing a value add deal and lots of renovations, um, you know, what's what's a good kind of uh, occupancy in those type of situations? 80 percent, 85 percent depends how much you're doing as far as maintaining cash flow in, in a situation like this, because I know that's the challenge, right, is when you have a value add thing, you're trying to do renovations, so you have to have some vacancy, but you also have to have enough income to, to stabilize the property while you're doing that. Yeah, I think the bigger question would be, is it worth renovating right now? And I, I think that everybody should be looking at that option. So I'll give you a couple examples. If you bought two years ago, like Michael said, you for sure got a lot of rent lift on your classic units, the ones that you were going to renovate. So it's possible that your classic units are at your business plan rent. Um, and so what we did is we took a look at um, all of that. And, and here's why. When you start to look at trade outs, let's say, let's say something was a thousand bucks and you renovated and it's supposed to be 1200. Um, you have to look at, do you really need something down 60 days? Um, and you know, how much more are you really going to get? And by the way, don't forget, you can always get a second bite at the apple. You don't have to renovate everything. You know, my, my whole career, I've been 22 years doing this. You, you know, we, I bought stuff in 08, 9, 10, rent, you know, value add was not a thing. It, it didn't exist. You were just buying per on a per pound basis. So, so there is some rationale and some, 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 uh, thought around, you know, why not just maximize cash flow today? And and then if you have like we have one building uh, that has 40, it has 40 unrented vacants. I go, just let's wait, you know, because we're going to spend 15 grand or 12 grand or 11 grand or whatever the number is. And and we're going to get whatever. But who cares? Like, let's put that on high ground. Let's put that 15 grand times 40 um, on high ground and just keep the thing full and maximize cash flow right now. Um, now you can't always do that because the lenders are involved, obviously, and some some of these are based on that. But um, you know, but I, I I think so. That's the long way of answering. You know, your occupancy can be whatever you want it to be. I believe. And and by the way, you know, there's apartment apartments are not distressed. You you know, occupancy and rent growth, they're not. I, I mean, I've been in markets where there's been three months free on a one month lease. Okay. That's bad. Okay. But still people are buying and building and, you know, during that, during those times, oddly enough. So this is just all about math. And you, you know, if, 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 if you can trade something out and it's worth taking it off the market, losing that three, four grand, um, you, well, you know, then do it. But if it's not, if it's affecting your cash, then you're probably better off, you know, just putting renovations aside for now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, just to, to hold if you're getting the the rent uh, bumps anyway. Uh, Michael, what are you, are you kind of doing that in your the, your properties? Have you guys put renovations on hold to try to maximize occupancy? Or what are some of the things you're doing on some of the value stuff that you have uh, been involved with? Yeah, similar to Ken. I mean, you know, we, we're, everyone's conserving cash. And, 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 and it's, on the one hand, easier to do for the reasons mm -hmm. Ken mentioned, which is rents have gone up so much uh, in the last 24 months, not so much maybe in the last six to 12 months. And so we didn't have to renovate the units. So we're like, yeah, crap. We're just getting our, our business plan pro forma without renovating anything. So we'll just not do that. And even before this stuff happened. Um, but you're right. You've got to, you've got to figure out the ROI on these things. Is it, is it more important to, to, uh, to try to generate a little extra income or is cash more important? Now, obviously both are, both are important. The problem is you don't want to run out of cash. And, and the, the headlines you're seeing are from people who are running out of cash, right? They're not operating well. The interest rate rise is squeezing their cash flow. Now they start going to red. They're, di they're getting into their construction fund and eventually the well will run dry. And so that's why you're seeing a lot of this kind of distress happening is uh, poor operation, poor cash management. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's really the the thing, right? When you run out of cash uh, in any business, you have uh, you have trouble. Uh, what would you say to, uh, you know, we've got a deal to get a capital call going and it's not a fun situation for investors or for us at all. What would you say uh, to operators that are, you know, short of cash and said, okay, you know, our op- occupancy may have dropped for a bit or, or something happened all of a sudden we were just seeing expenses way higher or, uh, or here's another situation we're seeing we've done all these renovations and now the valuation was way up here, but even after renovations, the valuations now have come down so substantially. Um, Ken, what do you say kind of in those situations? I know you mentioned the cash in refinance where you bring money to the table and obviously if you have wealthy partners, you can do that. Uh, but uh, what's the best approach for operators in those types of situations? Yeah. So first of all, I, I, I think that if people should have been, you, you know, I, I always say cut once, cut deep you know, instead of a thousand cuts. So, you know, a year ago when all this started, um, we sat down, we went through every asset and we said, this is our plan. And, you know, it's ultra managed. We know exactly how much cash we know what we're going to need. You know, this is, this is the time when actual management, uh, needs to step in. And the problem is Bronson is a lot of the people that raise money, they just know they just learned how to raise money. They don't know how to run buildings, not all of them, but a lot of them. So, you know, so what I, I think you're going to see in the next 15 months, all certainly through all next year, you're going to see the execution of the third party management company. That's what you're going to see. You're going to start to see these companies are going to get fired. Um, and then that, G- that GP or that sponsor is going to get, you know, a little bit of life for a little bit of while. And that all fingers will point to the operator. And, um, and by the way, it might be the operator it might, that might be legit, but you're going to see a tremendous amount of turnover on the third party management side primarily. But, um, you know, every asset has a plan every, and every asset is a little bit different. So, uh, as, as you guys know, we did a couple cash in refis, gosh, it's been six, eight months now. So what that is essentially, it's the opposite of a cash out, but the cash out, you actually get money and that's a tax-free event. Right. The cash in is not a tax-free event. Um, but as I said, you, you know, when we decided to just fix the rates, um, and so you can hedge the up and you can always refinance the down. So we said, all right. So I remember one, we paid 980 grand um, to fix the rate. Um, it proved our it improved our cash flow about 350 a year. And um, you know, so it's a three-year payback. And if if it happens earlier, great. Um, you know, but th- so what? You know, we didn't know how far it was gonna run. So so again, each asset I believe has its own story. And um, each one needs to be traded differently and each one has a different cash need. So, um, and that's how, I mean, this, this right now, this is actually, to me, this is the best time because this is exposing people's hands. You know, as, as Buffett says, you know, when the tide goes out, you see you yeah. swimming naked, right? Yeah. Well, that's what we're starting to see. We're starting to see who is, you know, who's good operationally, who has good asset control, who has good systems, who has good third party management, who has good accounting, um, who has good cash reserves, who, you know, who's managing their expenses. Well, um, all that stuff, um, all that stuff's important, but it's not as important when rents are going up 15, 20%, and then you're flipping in two or three years. So this is, this is not a flip, you know, this is now, Buy, this is, you know, extend and pretend. Right. And, um, and that's where we are. So to me, this is the best time I've been through this before and certainly in 08. And, um, it, it's interesting. I'm just, I'm just sitting in the theater watching it all, you know, go by. Yeah. It's interesting to watch, especially if you've been in the uh, multifamily game for a while, like you have, uh, both of you guys have. So, um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, different debt. Obviously, uh, you know, Michael, we, we partnered some stuff in the past. Um, we paid, I think, on a deal of millions of dollars of prepayment penalties through fixed rate debt, having things go up, you know, between 2010 and 2020, it seemed like you could just own something and you're a genius, right? It was like, you didn't have to do a whole lot. Now, obviously, operations is really important. Let's talk a little bit about um, 
kind of, you know, where you guys are seeing right now, is fixed debt absolutely essential? Is it something where you're still making it with bridge debt and caps? Uh, Michael, maybe can you, can you comment on that, just kind of how you're seeing the different debts and how they play out, either for new deals or current deals, or kind of how you see that? Well, debt is the problem right now, right? We're, we're, we're in this predicament because the debt market is vastly different than it was 12 months ago, like vastly different. Loan values are way down, right? And so we can't get the loan proceeds that we that we need to properly refinance, right? So then we're looking at pref equity. That's a that's a giant mess. So it it's really it's it's really what are you going to use, right? So you know, let's talk about fixed rate debt. Let's say you're buying. So you're buying right now, where you're locking in at the like a highest rate possibly. Yeah, it'll go a little higher, but you know the consensus is that we're kind of on the high end. Who knows what's going to happen? But why would you want to lock in something really high and then potentially pay a prepayment penalty if rates drop in two years? Like, does that make sense? I don't know, right? Now, what, let's talk about floating rate. Floating rate got us into this mess, right? So we're like, oh, that was bad. I'll never do that again. Well, maybe you should. Maybe you should consider floating rate. And and so uh, because it, it gives you a more flexible, uh, it gives you a more flexible exit. If I look at all the deals that we did on floating rate, even in hindsight, it would have been better to get floating rate than fixed rate because we would never never have had the massive exits we had last year, the massive refinance, if we didn't have floating rate debt. Now, is floating rate debt creating problems now? Yeah, absolutely. The question is, what are you supposed to do moving forward, right? And so, uh, you know, so one idea is that you can go in floating rate debt, unless it's a value add deal, right? For the value add, you can go floating debt and, get, and buy it. We, we did a deal four months ago, and we get a floating rate because it was a stressed asset. It was only 7% occupied. You're not getting a, a government-backed loan for that. But we got a staggeringly expensive four-year rate cap on that thing. It just we worked, worked into the deal. Now I have a four-year essentially fixed loan, but I can exit or refinance kind of at will. But the problem right now is debt. We're looking at HUD loans, for example. No one wanted to touch HUD loans with a 10-foot pole because they're a pain in the ass. They take forever uh, and they're a pain in the ass, right? But the, the loan proceeds are the highest on any loan product. So, so right now, the problem is, in my opinion, is debt. He who gets the right debt or the right capital stack wins because that's that's the problem right that's what's creating that giant gap between prices last march and right now is is the is the debt yeah that's it right it's 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 the debt uh ken what do you you've been doing this a long time i'm sure you guys you you're doing construction you're doing you know ground up stuff you're you know there's a lot of different stuff that you're doing between i imagine you know fix is obviously way better because it has more stability um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how particularly you've approached value add and how that's changed maybe over the last year or two, or has it changed at all? Um, yeah, well, I think Michael's spot on, on so many levels, uh, y- you know, like, let's just go back to two years ago where debt was say four, um, probably three, but let's say four and pref was six. So if you're doing 50, a 50, 50 split, your cost of money was five. You know what I mean? So that's called the blended cost of capital. So you have to look at the blended cost of capital between the two things, because either way, there's, there's some percentage that makes up 100%. So it's just easy for me to make my point with 50, 50, even though back then we would get more loan to value, let's say. So today, you know, rates are six. And pref is probably eight. So now your blended cost of capital is seven. So, so when you look at a deal today, you have to you have to acknowledge the fact that your blended cost of capital has gone up at least two points, potentially even more. And so the you know if you're gonna you know people can people can put all their money into a T bill and get north of five. Okay, so you're not going to raise equity under five. And uh, so that's a problem, you know, for, for, for you know, um, now that's not necessarily debt, that's equity, but it does affect debt when, when you know, if, if you're going to be into a debt fund, let's say, um, you know, you're going to, it's going to have to pay out significantly more than that. So, you, you know, so you always have to look at the blended cost of capital and how it affects the 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 project itself and i think that's the first thing and so you you know whatever that makeup is what michael said is right on he he, you know he did a floater with a four-year rate cap that was expensive but it made sense 
Um, and so, you know, that's one strategy. Assumptions are a thing right now, right? People are jumping on those. That's another thing. But if you, if you started building two years ago, like we did, uh, you know, and we thought our, our takeout, you know, our call our stabilized, uh, interest rate was going to be four or four and a half, you know, we've blown right past that. So obviously that affects a lot of stuff. Absolutely. Um, so we do have uh, Ellie Perlman with us. It's, it appears you're listed as Jeanette Robinson there, one of your team members. So that was a little confusing. Oh, now it's switched. Awesome. Well, welcome, welcome. I know we had a little technical difficulties. Really excited to have you. Um, and uh, Ellie works with uh, Blue Lake Capital, doing a lot of multifamily. Um, we're just kind of talking really, Ellie, about rates and, and kind of how obviously things have changed. Uh, fixed rate versus bridge debt. Um, you know, I guess we'll just kind of start with you on this as well, or kind of move on to you. Um, you know, do you see bridge still having a place for some multifamily deals? Are you doing all fixed rate? Um, you know, what's really changed, I guess, in the last year for you guys? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And hi, everyone. And, uh, apologies for the technical, um, you know, difficulties that we rarely have those. And so uh, that's what happens when you give logins to team members and then you cannot <laughs> this platform. So, um, when it comes to rates and, and we are multifamily sponsors and operators, and, uh, we have about half a billion in AUM, we sold half of our portfolio a few years ago. Um, it's, it really does not make sense right now to take any bridge. Um, and I used to be a real estate attorney in my past life. So I'm very conservative in my nature. Um, and, uh, the issue right now, uh, just to, uh, kind of um, relate to what Ken, you know, said earlier, when you have a negative leverage, meaning when your cap rate is, um, is, is higher than uh, when your debt is higher than your cap rate, it's going to be really hard to make any deal work and, and raise money from investors. And so right now, actually, um, what we're finding in the market, um, there, there are kind of three options, either you go with a bridge loan, and I personally, um, I'm not a huge favor, not that I didn't do it in the past, but there's so many variables in real estate that if you can take that one piece out of the equation and, and put something that is fixed, it's easier to handle any uncertainties and any changes. Um, so you still have bridge debt. And I don't think they're very um, you know, popular right now. You have fixed rate, mainly Freddie and Fannie agencies. Um, and as Ken mentioned, and, and I think also Michael talked about it, it's, you know, the rates are pretty high and that's going to make deals, um, you know, very there, it's going to turn a lot of interesting deals into very unattractive. The third option, which is what we're focused on is assumption. And so you can definitely assume a loan and kind of walk into, it's kind of a door to the past. So we closed about um, three weeks ago or so, we closed the deal at sub 3% fixed for 12 years with seven years IO. These, you know, and it was an off-market deal. So thankfully no one else saw the deal besides us. Um, but these things are, it, it's, it's, they're really hard to find. But it, when today's, you know, cap rates are five to 6%, depending on the markets, and we buy class B in the Sunbelt area, um, and when rates are five to six for interest rates are five to six percent, when you stumble on a fixed, you know, sub three percent um, interest rate loan, then it makes it a very, very interesting deal. So I think if you're looking to do something a bit different, focus on those assumption loans that nobody wanted to touch two years ago, three years ago. You know, everyone wanted to put fresh debt on it because, um, you know, you had four and a half, four percent fixed, and you could put three percent, three and a half, you know, nobody really wanted it. But that would be, you know, my um, recommendation and view. And that's what we're looking for. Those, you know, very lucrative uh, one in a million assumption, you know, deals. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's really is attractive. Obviously, the loan to value usually putting more money down for those, you know, sometimes 40, 50 percent down. But, you know, if you can make that work, it really is super attractive. Uh, let's, let's kind of talk a broader question here. We're going to get to some questions from the audience here in a minute. And we people have uh, a number of questions they want to ask you guys as well. Um, so let's look at the broader uh, environment. Rates are high. They've stayed higher than a lot of people thought they would. Um, how long do you think rates are going to stay high? And what is going to be 
the reason they would start to drop rates. Is there going to be a crisis or some unexpected thing, some blue uh, black swan thing that happens? Um, Ken, what do you think? What do you? Th how long do you think rates are going to stay this high? I know the Fed will say one thing. Uh, they would said you know, for a while, like, oh, we're going to keep rates at zero, keep rates at zero. And they quickly pivoted to start raising rates a couple of years ago. So when does that kind of quick change happen or what causes that? Well, as you guys know, I'm a C student, uh, but I ended up I ended up reading the Fed notes. Uh, I actually am reading there when they meet. Uh, so that's how nerdy I've been, because I, if you really read them, uh, you can kind of get a flavor of, you know, what what they're saying, what they're doing, who's who, you know, who, who's really, really wants the rates increase, who wants them lower. Um, it's pretty interesting. And they're all online on the on the on the Fed's website. So um, so I've been actually really trying to figure this out. Um, what I've found is everything that Powell has said so far, if you go back and look, uh, he's been kind of saying you know, this is what we believe and this is where we think it's going to be. You can you can follow that all the way along. It's been the media that's been kind of, you know, trying to figure all this out. But if you just look at what uh, Jerome Powell's been saying, um, um, I think that it's pretty clear their, their mantra has been from day one. We want to get inflation to two and they've never moved off of that yet. Only the media said, well, maybe they'll move the needle and all this other stuff. Well, what, what there's also this thing called the what they call the neutral rate, believe it or not. There's a rate above the rate called the neutral rate. Um, and they said, OK, when the economy's in neutral. Are, is it stable? In other words, are things not inflationary? So there's apparently a, a neutral rate above the two percent rate. So which they're going to be OK with with regard to interest rates. So. Um, so I don't believe that there we're going to see massive rate cuts. Um, I don't because we've had two now consecutive months of inflation increases, the last two. And, um, you know, so we did get down to, let's call it low threes or something. And, and now it's bounced back up. Not a lot, but a little bit. And I think we're heading into some energy issues. I don't know about you guys, but I just I went to the gas station the other day. It was six bucks to fill up my car, um, you know, and you're starting to see that. And and honestly, house prices are still going up and interest rates are going up. So shelter costs are up. Uh, so energy's up and I don't, I don't see food coming down either. And those are the three big ones. So I, I think that I know everybody's kind of hanging on that, but I always ask, okay, if you think they're going down, then why? And nobody has an answer. The, the, the reality is, and let's say they do, let's just hypothetically say they're going to cut rates. Okay. Who cares? Like, what are they going to do? A quarter here, quarter there, quarter here, half there. Okay. So maybe, maybe in 2025, they're what, a point less? That's not going to do anything. Like, you know what I mean? Like, let's just go all the way out to 2025 and, and say, okay, maybe they come down a point or even two, which I don't think they're going to do. Well, it's still these people that 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 uh, that bought and at three percent and and cap rates at sub three and three and let's say three and a half, they're still in trouble. Values are still going to be down, and this the buyers are still going to have to price that based on five percent debt or, or whatever it is. So it's just not going to be. It's not going to. It's not. It's gone so far that coming back to earth, you know, 11 rate increases. Um, I just don't see it. I, I think that, you know, I always, uh, you know, I, I say stay alive to 25, you know, make sure you have plenty of cash and, you know, and make sure think everything's buttoned up because I, I just don't see it. Yeah. So the, only, yeah that makes the, only exception, the only exception, Ken, and I agree with you is could be some kind of black swan event, right? Because a fed every time we've had some kind of thing happen, they always resume quantitative easing and dropped rates to zero. Like that's the only thing that might happen. But if nothing yeah. were to happen, yeah. I totally agree. I think rates are going to stay right where they are. But if there's some kind of crisis, that's yeah, how we fix That is true. The, the one thing I would just point out, though, what got us here were low rates. Yeah, absolutely. Like what, what, what made, in, what, you know, low debt creates consumption which creates bubbles asset bubbles are created in autos and tvs and real estate people can buy when rates are low that creates bubbles so so that's inflationary so that's why i think you know with inflation still bumping up a little bit you're i think you're right michael they may have to do that but what that's going to do is going to create inflation again oh yeah absolutely it'll just make it'll kick the can down the road 
You know, the thing that's interesting, too, is, you know, Powell, if you follow the guy, he really admires Paul Volcker, right? That with the, the work that that took and the effort that it took to raise rates and keep them high. And so I think he is looking at the guy's worth $150 million. So he's not doing this for the money, right? He's, he's He wants to create some sort of legacy and impact. So I think, um, you know, if he can, you know, get inflation under control, um, even though I don't really believe inflation is 3%, I think it's a little bit higher, but, <laughs> um, you know, we, we can kind of wink and say, okay, we got it. Um, Ellie, what do you think? What do you think uh, as far as rates, where we're headed, what, kind of, how would you respond? Yeah, I think generally speaking, you know, I, I agree um, with Ken and Michael, it's going to take, I would say probably 18 to 24 months until we, we see some stabilization and, um, it's it's interesting because um, it's kind of the chicken and the egg. So when the feds are saying one thing and then the media is saying something else and then it keeps changing and you keep reading because Google, you know, is listening to us and they feed me all kinds of, um, you know, news based on what they hear me talk about. So I get a lot of those news and then you have, um, you know, chief economist of XYZ saying that they're going to cut it. And then you see news that say that, no, the feds are actually, um, you know, going to uh, uh, keep increase interest rates. And so it's more about the volatility and uh, the fact that they're that investors can't really um, understand what's going on that that kind of makes the market freeze a little bit and makes a lot of investors just hold on to their money. Um, and so it's not really that, you know, interest rate can be 5%, they can be six, they can be three in as long because things are kind of unpredictable investors don't know how to price risk and how to va evaluate risk. And when they, in the confused mind says no. So when they see that, they don't know, you know, what to do with, with all the information that they're receiving that is, is contradictory and, and confusing. And so they decide, you know, we're just not going to invest until we see st something stable. And so I, I do think that the feds and, and I mean, Ken, you're right. They, they've been saying all along, it's going to take a long, you know, it's, it, we we're trying to hit 2%. And I think they said um, when they just started, they said it's going to take we're going to cut we're going to increase rates much higher than everyone wants and for much longer. And it's exactly what's happening. Obviously, everyone wants them to stop, you know, on, on one level. Um, but this is, um, you know, it's something that is going to take a couple of years. Now, we have a lot of loans that are due between, you know, six months ago, a year ago and the next two years. I, I've always said that, and my, maybe it's a contrarian, uh, you know, um, view. I don't think we're going to see major fire cells and all those, you know, uh, vulture funds that are out there going to wait for assets to, to be to, for the keys to be returned to the lender. It's not going to be similar to office because when it comes to multifamily, yes, debt, it sucks right now and things are hard, but and, there, and, and the future is not very clear for some assets, but the demand, unlike office, the demand for multifamily is still strong. If anything, it's stronger because of the increase in interest rates, more and more tenants cannot buy homes. So the demand, is, it fuels the demand for multifamily. So the demand drivers are still strong and they're stronger than ever. Um, but what's going to happen because the demand drivers are still there there's all, there are always going to be investors that um, will be willing to buy the GPs out, recap the deal. Um, there's going to there's a lot of capital calls, and um, it's not by the time if an asset is in trouble, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of fire. So there's going to be a lot of um, internal processes. Whether the lender is going to restructure the loan, and I'm, we're having calls with the lenders. We're asking, what do you do with all the other sponsors that can't pay you? So they're saying. We're actually working with them to restructure the loan. A, a lot of sponsors are doing uh, capital calls. So their investors are lined up to uh, put more money in the deal to save their capital. Um, so there's not, I don't think there's going to be that many assets that are going to be out there um, for Fire Sun. I may be wrong, but that's that's how I see it. But yeah, the feds, going back to your question, they're going to keep increasing uh, rates and, and we should all, you know, buckle up because... The ride is not over yet. So we're going to get to some questions. Go ahead, Michael, sir. I, 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 th I, th I don't know. I, I'm not, not sure if I agree 100% with you, Ellie, about the opportunity. I think there is going to be a lot of distress. Like, we're we're just talking to some peers of ours. Like, we have been working on this, like, nonstop, night and day for, like, at least 12 months. 
like what what can we do like ken said operations what can we show her up what contracts can, contracts can, can we renegotiate what can we do what are our options how can we finance what are we get right we've been doing this for like for 12 months they're like eating us up right but a lot of people we talk to they're like not doing anything and their loans expire in like 10 months like i think everybody's got their head in the sand right now uh you know and and, and i i don't know if people are actually being proactive i think they're thinking they're going to be okay rates are going to come down and they're going to be okay so so i don't know i i'm just saying that if if we're working so hard and you're working so hard and some a lot of these other people are not working that hard but they have the same problem I, there's only one place that I can go yeah it seems like the uh you know this does show as ken was sharing the warren buffett quote of you can tell who's been swimming naked when the tide goes out and the tide is starting to go out and we're seeing kind of you know <laughs> who's got their he's shorts got on, on. kenny's got pants on <laughs> i don't do know, know? He's, sitting, he, he's sitting behind there yeah <laughs> we, we can't tell but we'll, we'll assume he does that's funny I, on a side note i had uh recording one of these i was wearing my sport coat one time and i was wearing shorts and sandals and i did a little side shot to say you know it's like the business casual you can't really tell what people are actually wearing um anyway Kind of funny. We're going to get into some questions here in a minute. Uh, really loving the conversation here. Let's kind of go to this. Uh, what uh, I think this is the question everybody's asking is, well, what do I do now? Right. Do do I'm a, maybe people are seeing some. I, I talked to one investor. Like I mentioned, we have a capital call going. Uh, we've, one guy I talked to, he said he's in five other capital calls, like literally five other capital. Calls. So people are feeling kind of the pain of this. So the question a lot of people I'm sure in the audience are asking, too, is like, is it a good time or should I wait, right? And to Ellie's point, the confused mind will say to wait. So, I mean, Ken, how would you answer that? We'll go around just, do you think it's a good time? What are some things to be aware of or things to be, uh, you know, here's opportunities or challenges as a passive investor you should look at before getting involved? Well, you, you guys, I, I've been buying 20 years, right? So we we have a lot of assets, uh, 2 billion right now. I think we sold, you know, we've done 3 billion and acquisitions. And um, I will tell you right now is a lot easier than it was a year ago or two years ago uh, as a, as somebody who's trying to buy. So, you, you know, the brokers are calling me, you know, you know, the, you know, like all of a sudden, you know, I have a lot of inbound, you know, and, 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 and you know, it's, it's kind of fun because some of these young brokers, you know, they too uh, are not used to, you know, renegotiating and, and, uh, and price drops and, and, uh, retrades and stuff like that. And they're getting all fired up right now. And I love it because, you know, they're, you know, the, all they've ever seen is the apartment market go up and 30, 40, 50 buyers and, you know, multiple best and finals. So that's where we came from. That's not normal in my whole history. That's not normal. So yeah. we're, we're, you know, I can't wait for where we're headed uh, because uh, I want to buy. I love this asset class. I'm with Ellie. I think it's the greatest asset class. It's got a very bright future. And um, so any chink in the armor we can get from what was going on is good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it's um, actually the best time to buy because you finally know as a passive investor what to ask i mean what what to look for actually also as a sponsor when um everything was great we tried all to the best of our ability and knowledge to be conservative but you don't really know if it's going to be a debt issue if it's going to be um if the rents that you underwritten are not gonna hold up it's a performa nobody can really know what's going on but now when we're underwriting we know okay the we're going to take fixed loan, you know, we're going to place a fixed uh, rate debt on the property. It's going to be five to five and a half. So we know, uh, you know, to take the volatility out of the equation as much as we can. And just like Ken said, we're getting calls from uh, brokers that also say to us, hey, a deal that you passed on um, because the price was too high we it's been two months and now they're coming back and they say, you remember the price you put on, you know, the, the LOI, we'll take it. 
And you know, the market's uh, come down since then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was the old offer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Things change, right? So we see definitely, um, you know, pricing went down 20, 25% compared to a year ago, which is a huge delta. And this is actually the best time, you know, assets that are, we can now buy at 5%, 5.5% cap. They were no short than 3%, you know, 18 months ago. And nothing really changed besides, you know, the debt. And so um, I think it's actually a great time to buy because also uh, and, and you ask Bronson, what should a, a passive investor do? Ask as many questions as they can, starting with the debt. What is the debt structure? What's the worst that can happen? Walk me through it. Um, what are your assumptions on, on you know, rents? Do you think you can increase it 150, 300? Why do you think so? You don't have to be an underwriter. It's just, you know, a bit of a, a common sense. I think the the three the few things that I would focus on is understanding the debt. The second is understanding the uh, assumptions around the increase in income, because if you cannot boost your NOI and your your income, your asset is not going to worth more than it is now. Assuming you know very similar cap rate environment. If cap rates are down to four percent, then you know it's 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 again it's a celebration. Um, and then the third thing is, is, you know, of course, I'm going to ask what's, how much skin in the game do you have? Are you investing your own money? So you know that they're very motivated as sponsors to work as hard as they can. Um, and it's not a deal breaker, but it's always, you know, a plus that these are the, as, as a passive investor, I would ask those three things around um, alignment of interest, you know, slash skin in the game, in, income assumptions, and also, you know, um, the debt. Great word. Thank you, Michael. So if you're a passive investor, you have to separate deals that are in the future from the ones that are in the past. It's like totally, it's like night and day. Like this deal we closed four, four months ago was underwritten completely different than any deal in 18 or 24 months ago. They're different deals, right? 18, 24 months ago, we got 3% debt. We got a floating rate with an interest rate cap, right? We're projecting these things no one could have foretold. So you could argue that anything bought over the last eight to 24 months was bought towards the very top of the market, which is probably true. Okay, now we have lost so much valuation that you could argue within 12 months, we went from the top of the market to the bottom of the market. Like normally these things take like seven years, I thought. Now we've come to the other extreme. It's a completely different market. If you're buying a deal now, you're underwriting to current conditions, which is super high interest rates, whether using floating rate, interest rate cap, or fixed rate, super high interest rate, right? You're gonna you're gonna be using much lower uh, rent increases because, gosh, some are even negative or very flat, right? So so separate. I think the problem with the past investors, especially if you're involved in capital calls, you're like, oh, syndication is bad, right? But that's the wrong conclusion to draw. You have to look at what happened over the last 24 months and realize that deals that are coming up right now are different animals entirely. So if you can, if you're able to emotionally disconnect yourself from it then look at those new opportunities from that lens. Really pay attention, as Ellie said, look at the debt. The debt is absolutely critical, but look at the underlying assumptions and you can tell that that the deals are written completely differently. So it's that saying, you know, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. It's the best time, the time of maximum pessimism is the best time to invest, but a lot of people don't this see is that. Challenge, this is a challenge for all of us. I mean, there's no question yeah. that we're gonna get an amazing opportunity over, over the next six to 12 months for the reasons that was mentioned. But now we're going to try to raise capital in, in an environment where there's blood in the streets. And people are like, oh, well, I'm going to just see what happens. And if you do that, you're going to miss the opportunity. That's, a, you that's know, true. You know what's interesting, Michael? We've been hearing from some investors in the past, you know, three, four years. Well, prices are too high. We're going to wait right. to see the deals. Where are these investors? We don't see them. We don't yeah. see them. So it's it's interesting to want to get a great deal. But that's what it means to get a great deal to take some amount of risk when you see that things are changing. And I do think that, um, you know, cap rates are going to compress in the future, probably not in the next 18 months, but they will. And I don't think they're going to stay five and a half right now, a beautiful class B building in a great neighborhood, you know, in, um, um, in, in Charlotte or in Atlanta, I don't think it's going to stay five and a half percent. And nobody knows, right. I'm not an investment, an investment advisor. Um, th but this is, what I do for a living, I buy and sell multifamily assets. So that's also how value is being created. 
when you're buying at um at a high it's this is the buy high sell sell um or this is actually the buy high sell low when we're talking about cap rates buy at a higher cap rate sell when the cap rate is low even if the NOI is flat you're going to make money hopefully NOI is going to go up but cap rates are going to go down and that's also a big portion of of how you make you know money but can you project in your underwriting a lower cap rate like i have a problem with that <clears throat> yeah you know we do all the time a, like a 6.2 cap rate and in your underwriting you're putting a five year exit at 5 i'm like i can't defend that because it, oh. it, it I, I mean it should you're right it's like it should normalize but i can't defend oh. that underwriting i'm, I'm sorry i thought you were problem. i thought you were asking if we're putting higher we always put higher cap rate Okay. You're saying cap rate should compress over the next five years, and you're right. Well, we don't underwrite it. Yes. We're yeah. hoping for it. I just, I just can't defend it. It's like. Yeah. I buy at five. I underwrite to six. I hope for four. Guys, we're yeah. going to take a quick. We're going to take a quick pause here. I have a shameless plug to make, and then we're going to come back with some questions. So let's get the chat box going with questions, guys. I know a lot of people uh, engaging here have some questions. There's some coming in here. I'm going to share my screen for a minute here. Um, so this is my first full-length book coming out uh, called Fire Yourself coming out here shortly. We're actually having the pre-launch team next week. I'll put something in the chat if you're interested in getting a free copy of the book, writing a review, and helping promote it. It has a forward by this guy. I don't know who it is, Ken McElroy, um, in there, which is which is kind of fun. So, And then Michael, I think, has an endorsement in there, too. So I will share that in the chat. So that's uh, super exciting. Also, uh, an event coming up called the Advanced Real Estate Investing Summit, October 19th and 20th, we're, we're not sold out, but we're getting uh, we're, we're getting really a lot of interest in this. Uh, we have uh, David Green here in the middle from the Bigger Pockets podcast. Uh, Ken's going to be a part of this event as well. Uh, I don't see Ken's picture here. I don't know why he's oh he's right in the front there. He's right there. I don't and have a motorcycle got... jacket on though. I, you know, <laughs> yeah, like you. that's right. That's how you know you got it going, right? <laughs> got got a Neil Bawa, a bunch of folks here. So I will put a uh, info in this for the chat. We still do have the early bird rate going. Uh, there's limited space. It's going to be a phenomenal event. It's a Thursday evening and Friday all day in Los Angeles. So I'll stick that in the chat. We will jump to some questions here. So let me uh, get these questions going, and then I'll stick those links in the chat for everyone. Uh, so the question comes here uh, about rate caps, about having a rate cap. Is there some chance that you guys think that rate cap providers will blow up, like almost like the insurance, you know, where rate cap is, it limits or you get reimbursed if rates go higher than the cap that you have, um, you get reimbursed later. Is there a chance that some of those guys go out of business? What do you guys think? It's Can entirely you, possible. Yeah, entirely possible. Depends on the that company. Would, yep. It would be bad. Yeah, that would that would be pretty bad for everybody, right? So it, yeah. it will be. I think I don't know if the government is going to step in, um, but I think it's very likely that at least some of them are going to become insolvent. I just don't see. I mean, when when we were buying uh, rate caps, um, it went. You know, some of them. I think it was three years ago were four hundred thousand dollars, and then re in recent years it would one to two million. It was one to two million dollars, and it's. I always thought of it as an ins buying an insurance from an insurance company while you're mm -hmm. driving your car, and 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 they're watching you, you know, having a car accident in slow motion. So they know they will pay. Prices went up. Um, I think they're going to be in 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 some trouble. At least some of them. I think probably will go out of business. Um, yeah, not not a fun scenario. That's yeah, that's good. Um, another question here is, um, let's see, what does a good deal look like for you and your investors? The ideal play has been to be able to have a return of capital as soon as possible. Some like some sort of refinance event or an infinite return scenario. Does that seem harder now? Or what is it? What does a good deal look like right now as far as a plan? Anybody can jump in <laughs> all at once. <laughs> well, I think the, you know, an infinite return requires a cash out refinance at some point. So, you know, the, the variable of course is interest rate. So, um, you know, and, and if interest rates keep going up, then that means probably cap rates are probably also going to go up a bit. Um, so whatever you do on a value add might be gone, uh, even though you have that. So you might have more cash flow. Ir the irony is you have more cash flow, but your cap rates have also gone up. So you you might not even be able to scoop it then. I, I think the, the, the way 
the way to look at this next period of time is um, is not short term infinite return, more of a long term coupon. And and then let the economy do its thing and uh, and then take advantage. So, you, you know, like everybody's into this infinite return and this, you know, obviously um, the value adds and all that. My entire career was not centered around that. It was just buying assets, having the tenants pay down the debt and and having the investors get reoccurring cash you know, making a very good return on their money. What, you know, the, the infinite return model and the cash out tax free cash out, uh, while it's been great, um, you know, that song's over for a while. It's, yeah. it's interesting, Ken, I, I think investors' expectations have changed quite a bit. Uh, and, and I think that's a good thing. I think their return expectations are lower. I think people want more of a guaranteed return. They, they care a little less about uh, upside, I think that's one of the reasons that these debt funds are a little bit more popular yeah. now these days uh, than than anything else. People just want to park their money and get nine or ten percent return. I, I think going back to that mindset, Ken, you know, that the more traditional buy and hold is probably not a bad idea. I think I think everybody got, kind of got really aggressive with these cash out refinances, and that works when interest rates are stable or going down. But when they're going up, man, the, the game is the game is over. And I know I don't know if we can sell investors on that unless the deal is very clear. But the problem is if interest rates are going to go up, that business plan is going to go away. And I think investors can see through that. So I think it's going to be tough, a tough sell. Um, I have a bit of a different angle. So um to me, first and foremost, before I even start looking at the debt, I'm looking at the tenant base. If the deal looks great on paper, but tenants are kind of challenging tenants and they don't pay on time. It doesn't matter what kind of debt you're going to put on the on the property. It doesn't matter how great your team is. It's just not going to generate enough cash flow. So I'm looking for those boring assets, boring tenants. Um, that's first and foremost. That's what makes the deal a great deal. It's the tenants. It, that's the one component that was the, the um, common denominator when it comes to all the great exits we've had. It's the tenants. That's one thing. The second one... Um, is if the deal works with a fixed rate 50 percent you know 55 percent ltv which is pretty low then to me it's a great deal because even if interest rates are going to go up it's not going to really impact not directly going to impact your cash flow it's it might impact um your cash flow in a much less you know less impactful way uh, indirectly because it's going to increase the tenant's um, cost of living because everything is more expensive. So maybe some of them are going to be late or unable to pay their rent, but it's not going to be as significant as debt going from $100,000 a month to $200,000 and, you know, kind of wiping the entire um, cash flow out. So um, this just the, the strength of the tenant base and any deal that is that has conservative LTV with a, um, you know, fixed rate loan, for me, that combination is powerful. Um, that is what I consider you know, consider a good deal in today's market. So, guys, I want to be uh, sensitive to time. We are getting toward the top of the hour. Um, just wanted to say a thank you to each of you. You are uh, all uh, amazing operators. I have tremendous respect for uh, the value you guys are adding to the multifamily space. I really uh, encourage everybody listening or watching on a replay to reach out to you guys, hear about your deals. You guys are all actively doing deals. Uh, we're actively doing deals both in multifamily as well as alternatives such as ATMs and car washes. So uh, you know, everybody has investor clubs to so reach out if you're not on people's investor list to hear um, what they're doing. If you heard something that you like from someone here, uh, let's just go around real quick, uh, starting with Ken and just say, you know, anything you're working on or anything you wanted to share the ways people can connect with you or something that you wanted to promote. Yeah, we're still extremely active. We're, we're doing one to three offers a week. Uh, and uh, sourcing as much as we can. Uh, we have a 220 unit in, in escrow now. Um, I'm actually buying a company. I'm buying a billboard company right now. I'm in escrow on Love that. Um, nice. You know, it's a um, 20 year old business. And the reason is um, it's a bonus depreciation play. So I, I can write the whole company off in one year because billboards fall under bonus depreciation. So nice. um, I, I sold a few assets this year. And we had huge, huge capital gains, and so I'm I'm able to offset it with, um, with the billboards. So and the cash flow. So, 
Um, you know, but we're continuing to look for for good, uh, you know, uh, I would call them, um, you know, deals that that have reoccurring revenue, reoccurring cash flow. Awesome. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate you being here. Uh, Michael. Yeah, our, our investment firm is called Nighthawk Equity at nighthawkequity.com. And we're an alternative investment uh, focused on the real estate space. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Uh, there's a free download on nighthawkequity.com. It's a passive income calculator, which is really cool. Uh, like Ellie, we believe that uh, real estate is really the best investment vehicle. So you can get that at nighthawkequity.com forward slash calculator. And real quick, if you're interested in getting into the game yourself as an active entrepreneur or syndicator and want to take advantage of these opportunities, then we just put out a free masterclass called Apartments 101. And you can see that at apartments101.co. It's just four free videos, and it kind of gives you an introduction to the syndications. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate you being here, man. Um, Ellie, how can people uh, follow you, get in touch, and uh, track what you're doing there? Yeah, absolutely. So you can definitely reach out to us. Um, if you Google my name, Ellie Perlman, um, or go to our website, uh, bluelake-capital.com, uh, we're actively raising. Um, it's only for accredited investors. Um, you know, we have a deal that we're raising for, and we also have a fund. Um, and we have, um, you know, we're offering investor to investors six to eight percent pref. Um, and so that's way above market right now, not to mix with cash on cash, very different, uh, because some of the pref can be accrued to the end, but um, we're you know, uh, it's it's essentially uh, something that is open right now, fixed rate, um, you know, loans. So we were taking the um ambiguity uh you know we're taking essentially the debt um out of the equation uh it's you you can uh essentially look at uh, our website and uh look at the offers that we have there again it's blake-capital.com awesome well thank you everybody for being here today i know it just the time went really fast uh, we will have a replay available it will be on uh the bronson hill youtube channel so you can check that out it should be out later you also get an email with that as well uh, but uh, appreciate everybody being here. We will have another event. I think our next and probably last live event, uh, at least virtual event of the year, will be the first week of November. I'll get some dates out for that. That'll probably be an economic panel. And then again, if you can make the Advanced Real Estate Investing Summit, October 19th and 20th in Los Angeles, we'd love to see you in person there. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thanks to our panelists yeah. as well. Look forward to seeing everybody soon. Thank you.